As you're turning in your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians, the New Testament, the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 14, as you all know that when we have come out of Easter, we enter the seven-week period called Pentecost, which ends on next Sunday, the day of Pentecost, and in alignment with the season of Pentecost, we have been engaged in a series of sermonic study of scripture around the work of the person, the purpose, and the power of the Holy Spirit. As you turn into 1 Corinthians 14, we have had three installments, and we paused last week that we might hear God speak to us through our children. Today, we pick back up into the fourth segment of this series on the Holy Spirit. And as we do so, I want to invite you to hear a reading from the writer, the Apostle Paul, and 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians, as is read in the New King James Version of the Bible, the first 19 verses. If you're physically able, won't you stand with us to hear the reading of God's Word in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, beginning in verse number 1. If you're there with me, won't you say amen? amen. Hear what Paul writes to us. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you might prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. But he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? Even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? So likewise you, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of languages in the world and none of them is without significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Even so, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at the giving of your thanks, since he doesn't know what you're talking about? For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God that I speak with tongues more than all y'all put together. <laughs> Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. Oh, you've been waiting on this one. Do me a favor. Look at, look at your neighbor. Give him today's sermon title. Tell him, neighbor. Oh neighbor, oh neighbor, what are you talking about? What are you, talking about? <laughs> you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. What are you talking about? In this series on the Holy Spirit, we've been attempting to lay a foundation that will enable us as believers to understand the purpose, the person, and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I began this journey with a foundational truth that I will reiterate repeatedly until we're done, and that is that the Holy Spirit 
does not simply rest and reside in the realm of Pentecostalism. The Holy Spirit is not simply that which is available and accessible to our Pentecostal brothers and sisters, but rather the Holy Spirit is the gift of the indwelling presence of God within every born again believer. That if you believe Jesus Christ is Lord, and if you've ever opened your heart and confessed him as your personal Lord and Savior, if you've said yes to the call of Christ, I want you to know, regardless of how charismatic your life is or is not, the Holy Spirit operates within you as a believer. And to that end, I've tried to lay some building blocks upon which we stand today. And the first one is that you should never limit your perspective of the presence of the Holy Spirit to what you witness in a worship service. They're really the Holy Spirit is not limited to how long your worship is, to how many people shout, to how many people pass out at the altar. The reality is that the true power of the Holy Spirit is not limited to what you observe in worship, but rather how you live after the benediction. If, if you really want to know if you've got the Holy Spirit, don't, don't listen to him shout on Sunday. Follow him home after church. Because the power of the Holy Spirit is meant to cause us to live as faithful witnesses outside of church. I suggest to you, secondly, that one cannot grasp the power of the Holy Spirit without understanding the doctrine of the Trinity. So we walked down memory lane, went into some history, dealt with some Greek, looked at some church councils to remind ourselves that God is but one substance, homoousios. And that that homoousios, that one substance of God, is made manifest in three hypostases that we identify as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which is better known as Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. You can't understand the sustaining work of the Holy Spirit without acknowledging that the Holy Spirit is of the same homoousios as the God that spoke creation into existence, the God that became incarnate in Jesus Christ, and now the God who seeks to dwell in your life. One God in three manifestations. And since the Holy Spirit shares the same homoousios as God, it is appropriate, Sister Joyce, to pray to the Holy Spirit. I've been trying to encourage you in the practice of prayer to learn to pray to the Holy Spirit that wherever you would pray God the Father or wherever you would pray to Jesus Christ, insert the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, thank you for another day's journey. Holy Spirit, thank you for keeping me while I slept and slumbered over another night. Holy Spirit, thank you for bringing my children back home to me safely after a day of school. When, when you sit down to eat, learn to pray to the Holy Spirit. Good bread, good meat, good Holy Spirit, let's eat. You, you've got to learn to pray to the Holy Spirit. And in that homoousios of God, we've identified that in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit it's linked and connected to the wisdom of God, the Sophia of God, which is feminine in its gender, which means that it is biblically correct and appropriate to refer to the Holy Spirit in feminine language. She and her, she moves within us. And, and I know, I know, I know that has bothered some of y'all. Some folk just can't stomach the idea of referring to the Holy Spirit as she. And I want to let you know, I'm not saying the Holy Spirit is a woman. What I am saying is that God ain't a man. Okay. I'm going to say that again. I'm not saying the Holy Spirit's a woman, but I am saying that God is bigger than gender. God is not man. God is not woman. And we've got to be careful of limiting language to God, to male-dominant language that excludes the creative power and genius of God that is seen in our sisters in Christ, that if a woman is made in the image of God, then God embodies both male and female characteristics. And... We prove ourselves to be enlightened saints when it's all right to call God she. Stick around. You'll get used to it after a couple Sundays. 
And finally, in the part that we left off on, I suggested to you that the real power of the Holy Spirit is to order your life to the moment where you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Hear me, the Holy Spirit was working on you before she was working in you. That, that, that if you look back at to what moved and motivated you to give your life to the Lord, that Sunday you got up and you walked down that aisle and you said yes to Jesus, that was not because of the choir singing. That was not because of the preacher preaching. That was not an emotional moment. That was the Holy Spirit ordering your steps to say yes to the Lord. And the minute you said yes to Jesus, she entered your life permanently. The Holy Spirit has set up permanent residence in the life of every believer. And that we all need continual refilling. Because no matter what your Pentecostal cousin tells you, nobody is Holy Spirit filled. Because no matter how much of her you have and she has of you, you always need some more. Go and preach my sermon for me. Terry, I, I got a disturbing email a few weeks ago that accused me of being a Pentecostal basher. That there were some who had Pentecostal backgrounds and said, Pastor, you are, you're bashing Pentecostalism. You're, you're making light of their tarrying and you're making light of the laying on of hands and uh, you're, you're demeaning their, their worship by calling it charismatic chaos. And, and as I did in that email, I want to publicly apologize to anyone that has some Pentecostal background, I am not trying to bash Pentecostalism. What I am underwear of is that many of us have been raised mainline Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterian, and when you've been raised in those traditions, you tend to be a little resistant to openly speaking about the Holy Spirit because your only understanding of the Holy Spirit has been limited to what you've witnessed in Pentecostal churches. And since you don't have people laying hands on you, and you don't carry oil in your purse, and you don't talk in tongues, and you have never laid out at the altar, since you don't shout and know, you don't even know how to do the Pentecostal two-step. You, you, you don't even... You, you, <laughs> and you don't tarry when you come to church. You, you came to Alp Street because you know we got to get out of here before noon to get to brunch. You, you are on a time schedule because you're not that way. You tend to believe that maybe you don't have the Holy Spirit because your only understanding of the Holy Spirit is what you witnessed over there. And so what I'm seeking to do is break the Holy Spirit out of the Pentecostal portrait of charismatic outpourings so that every born-again believer in Alpha Street Baptist Church who confesses Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior has no hesitation to declare that I am born again and I have the Holy Spirit in my life. That, that, we're, all we're trying to do is break the Holy Spirit out of the limitations of charismatic worship. And you know what? That is exactly what the Apostle Paul is doing in 1 Corinthians. Paul is seeking to broaden their understanding of the Holy Spirit. Hear me, when you study the church in Corinth, you'll find out that these Corinthians, this church in Corinth is arguably, it's arguably Paul's greatest ministry success in planting a church. No church compared to Corinth. Corinth exploded in growth. They started as a handful of believers that met in a member's house. And the gospel was so effective in Corinth that they multiplied and added services. Next thing you know, they're meeting four times a week in parking and walking over cobblestones, blocks at a time, in order to get into the house of God. They're staying in overflow. They didn't leave when the ushers told them that the sanctuary was full, but they... <laughs> they, they exploded in growth. And part of their growth was based on their location. Corinth was a major trade route 
between the Aegean and the Mediterranean seas. And as a result, thousands of men and women would come in and out of Corinth. And it gave those Corinthians an opportunity to witness to Jesus Christ, to men and women who were coming and going. And Corinth was a church that, that, that survived pastoral transition. That after Paul left, they hired a brother named Apollos. And Apollos was a bad mamma jamma. Paul could put pen to paper, but if you put a microphone in front of Apollo's mouth, he would proclaim the gospel with such authority that thousands would give their life. Corinth was the church of the movers and shakers. Corinth was an affluent congregation. The, the, them were the money saints. GS 13 and above, that's who went to Corinth. Matter of fact, Corinth had so much money that whenever Paul needed a donation, he would go to Corinth and ask them because he knew if anybody had a million dollars to give to the opening of another church, it was the church in Corinth. This was a growing, vibrant, affluent church. Corinth had it going on. But in the words of that renowned African-American poet, Christopher Wallace. <laughs> also known as Notorious B.I.G., a.k.a. Biggie Smalls. Christopher Wallace said, Mo money, Mo money, you are not saved. You, <laughs> you knew that one too quick. You knew that one too quick. More money, more problems. For all that Corinth had, they had problems that were greater. Go back and read 1 Corinthians. Look at all the problems this church has. They are, they are divided among themselves, split up into cliques and factions. A group over here said, we like Paul. A group over there said, we like Apollos. A group up there said, we like Trinity. A group over there said, like, we like Psalms of Praise. A group over there said, VOT. A group up there said, royal priesthood. A group over there like this and that. They were splintered among themselves. Not only were they splintered, but Paul recognized they were suing each other and taking each other to court. And Paul said, listen, you are damaging the witness of the body of Christ when members can't resolve their own issues but have to stand before a judge and have a judge litigate something that ought to be prayerfully handled. That they, they, they had communion problems. The Bible said that the rich and the affluent would get to communion before those working the third shift and they would eat everything and drink everything and they were drunk in church before the third shift got off and by the time the third shift, blue collar folk got to church, the rich folk were already drunk. Look, 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 ain't nothing like real Bible. I'm, I'm trying to tell y'all, uh, ain't no drama like real church. In, in Corinth, there was a son who was sleeping with his daddy's new wife, so a son was sleeping with his stepmama. I'm telling y'all, ain't no drama like real church. <laughs> Elaine, somebody asked me the other day, do I watch Greenleaf? I said, no, I watch Alfred Street. Because there's no drama <laughs> like black church drama. This church had some problems. And one of their major problems that Paul identifies is a problem in worship. Paul recognizes that this church has a tongue-talking problem. The term that's actually used in Bible language, so you know it for speaking in tongues, is glossolalia. Let the church say glosso, glosso. not say lalia. Lalia. lalia, not say it fast, glossolalia. glossolalia. Look, you sound like you're talking in tongues. Glossolalia. <laughs> glossolalia, the speaking in tongues. Paul recognizes church in Corinth has a glossolalia issue. And the issue is that in the church, they've lifted glossolalia so high that they believe that is the only sign of their spiritual depth and maturity. And so when the church gathered together in worship in Corinth, everybody tried to exhibit glossolalia. 
that people were standing up speaking in foreign tongues in heavenly languages, almost competing with one another to show who had more Holy Spirit. And Paul said, listen, your worship has become chaotic and disorderly because everybody's jumping up, acting like glossolalia is the only thing church ought to be about. They have put an inordinate emphasis on talking in tongues. The same way you see in many Christian circles today, an overemphasis on speaking in tongues. By wave of hand, how many people have ever heard someone tell you that if you have the Holy Spirit, you ought to be able to prove it by speaking in tongues? Some of us have even been in worship services where someone may have been praying or preaching, and then all of a sudden, as if a button were pushed, in the middle of a good English sentence, <laughs> you hear someone, hey, Shanta, hey, Bo Sata, can he add that bo? And you're sitting there trying to go, what in the world just happened? <laughs> There's such an emphasis on it that in some traditions, they believe that if you do not speak in tongues, that before church is over, they will take you into the back room, surround you with the sisters, who teach you how to speak in tongues. I've heard it said to me, if you just say hallelujah fast a couple hundred times, you'll begin speaking in tongues. I had a very traumatic experience my junior year at Duke University. Here I am, a Baptist preacher, and these two brothers, they got saved yesterday. <laughs> and they joined a Pentecostal church, cornered me on the main campus of Duke University, and asked me, do I speak in tongues? I said, no. They formed a circle around me, grabbed hands, and said they were not going to let me go till I spoke in tongues. You, you ain't going to make me <laughs> speak in tongues. And they start saying they're not going to let me go. They hemmed me up, so I spoke in another tongue. I hollered out, yo, yo, and called on every frat brother I know to come down to the yard and get me out of this. How you like that tongue? It, 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 it's a glossolalia problem. It's a tongue talking problem. So, so Paul writes to address it. Whenever Paul writes a letter, the key to understanding the letter is a seminary term called exigence. Let the church say exigence. Exigence is literally, it's just the reason Paul writes. What issue is Paul addressing? When Paul writes 1 Corinthians, he's trying to address some issues. He's saying, listen, we got to deal with this division in the church. We got to handle y'all's communion issue. We've got to deal with you all taking each other to court. We got to handle this son sleeping with his stepmama. And we've got to deal with glossolalia. So in the 14th chapter, Paul is trying to teach us some things about talking in tongues. Now notice what Paul doesn't do. Paul doesn't chastise them for speaking in tongues. Paul doesn't rebuke them speaking in tongues. Paul doesn't tell them they shouldn't talk in tongues. Because Paul understands that glossolalia, the speaking in a heavenly tongue, is an authentic gift and expression of the Holy Spirit in the life of certain believers. He wants them to understand that talking in tongues is not gibberish. Talking in tongues is not some made-up phenomenon. Talking in tongues is not something that just happens in the backwoods of Kentucky. Speaking in tongues is not that which is just reserved for those on the lower rungs of the social economic ladder who know about Azusa and the Church of God in Christ. Speaking in tongues is a valid expression of the presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of some believers. 
And I say that because if you have never spoken in a tongue, you should not belittle tongue talking. If that's never been your experience, you should not deny its validity. If it's never happened to you, that does not mean that that is not of God. And Paul wants to be clear that speaking in tongues is a gift of the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, Paul says, listen, I know y'all think you can talk in tongues. But he says in verse 18, if anybody can talk in tongues, it's me. I can, un I can out tongue talk all y'all. And notice what he says in verse 5. This is deep. He says, and I wish all of you would talk in tongues. Hear the desire of Paul. I wish that all of you would talk in tongues. Why does Paul say that? To understand why Paul believes that every believer ought to be able to speak in tongues goes back to Paul's understanding of how the Holy Spirit enables us to engage in glossolalia. Can I teach Bible? To understand this, you've got to go back a book or so to Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. In Romans 8, 26, here's what Paul teaches. He said, listen, y'all, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we don't always know how to pray as we should. So the Holy Spirit makes intercessions for us when we don't know how to pray as we should with groanings that we don't understand. Paul says, listen, the power of the Holy Spirit is to intercede with you in your time of prayer because you don't always know how to pray like you should pray and to say what you should say. So the Holy Spirit intercedes with glossolalia that you don't always understand. Now, Judy, there's three things about that you have to understand and grasp. Number one is that one of the purposes of the Holy Spirit is to intercede in your time of prayer. Literally, watch this, watch this, saints. The Holy Spirit is your primary prayer partner. Here you are sowing into the Word Network and trying to find someone you can touch and agree with in church. You, you don't have to find somebody in church. The Bible says that when you kneel before God, the Holy Spirit is waiting to join in that prayer with you and intercede in your prayers. That, that, that she comes in the time of your prayer. That, 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 that you don't have to pray and feel like ain't nothing happening. You don't have to pray and feel like there's no power in your prayer. You don't have to pray and wonder, what should I say to God? Because somewhere before the uh, our Father and the Amen, the Holy Spirit shows up to help us in our prayers. She, she intercedes. And watch as Paul says, Glossolalia is primarily prayer language. That when glossolalia is authentic of the Holy Spirit, it is prayer language. Watch what he says in verse 2 of our text. Paul says, listen, when someone speaks in tongues, they're not speaking to men. They're speaking to God. So when I pray and I begin to speak by the intercession of the Holy Spirit, my speech is not to you. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to God. And you are eavesdropping on a private conversation. He says that, that Holy Spirit, watch how deep this is. The Holy Spirit intercedes in prayer, which means the Holy Spirit helps me talk to God better. Watch, watch the depth of this. God helps me talk to God. 
The Holy Spirit shows up in prayer so that I can communicate with God better than I can in my own ability. That God helps me talk to him. And if the Holy Spirit intercedes in prayer and glossolalia is a prayer language, that's why Paul says, I wish all of you would. Because for you to engage in glossolalia in your private prayer means you're praying. And that's why I wish all of you would. Catch the depth of this, Sharice. That means that the intercessory power of the Holy Spirit to guide me in prayer through glossolalia is available to everybody. That is available to everyone. Every born again believer can experience the intercessing of the Holy Spirit in our time of prayer. Now what you ought to be asking is, then why come everybody don't talk in tongues when they pray? How is it that some pray and have the intercession and some don't? You want a real answer? It's right here in the text. Because Paul says in Romans 8, 26, the Holy Spirit only intercedes when you don't know what to say. Come here, come here, come here. So, so if your prayer life only is to the extent of you praying what you know you need to ask God for and then you say amen, you don't stay on your knees long enough to get to the point where you ain't got nothing else to say. Ooh, ooh, about to get quiet. Because the intercession doesn't come with a prayer that goes, Lord, fix this, give me that, change that, amen, and I'm on my way. No, the Holy Spirit only intercedes when you've been praying so long that you ain't got nothing else to ask God for. You've laid out all your requests. You've laid out all your petitions, and yet you're still not done praying because all you want to do is connect with God and feel the power of God and be strengthened by God. you got to stay in that committed place of prayer. That intercession doesn't come with shower prayers. Intercession doesn't come with Jesus wet prayers. Intercession only comes to those who are not concerned with how long it's been they've been praying. Who are not rushing off to the next assignment. But those who reach that deep place where you tell God, listen, I'm not down here because I need you to give me more money. I'm not down here asking for a new job. I'm not down here asking you to turn things around. God, I'm on my knees and laying on my face because I want to feel you and see you and know you and walk with you and discern you and love you. That's when you get to that place. Now, it needs to be said so that you don't get it confused and walk out of here thinking I'm saying what I'm not. The intercession of the Holy Spirit and you speaking in tongues in your private prayer does not make your prayer more powerful. It doesn't mean that you're going to get what you want. It doesn't even mean that your prayers get to God faster and higher. Nor does not praying in tongues mean your prayer is weak. I'm glad that God hears quick prayers. I'm glad that God hears emergency prayers. I'm glad that God hears me when I'm not on my knees as long as I should be, but he answers anyhow. Who can I teach Bible right here? My Bible says that Peter gets out the boat, he's walking on his way to Jesus, and he starts sinking in the water. He ain't got time to lay out with some long, drawn-out prayer. All he can say is, Lord, save me. And somebody knows that that's been good enough every now and then. God, save me. He, 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 he will. That intercession is just another level of connection and intimacy with God. Let me hurry up. So, so the issue is not that they speak in tongues, that is a valid expression of the intercessing of the Holy Spirit in my private prayer life. Paul's problem is how they're doing it in public. There's a line in the sand between glossolalia in your private prayers and in public worship. 
Paul said, here's your first problem. You all don't understand that in order for it to edify in public, there must be interpretation. It is one thing for you to pray privately and engage the Holy Spirit in an intercessory way that leads to glossolalia. It's another when you're standing in front of people. And Paul says this in verse 19. He said, you know what? I would rather speak five words you understand than 10,000 words that don't make sense to you. That whenever it is publicly engaged, there needs to also be interpretation. As a matter of fact, one could argue that public speaking in tongues without interpretation is actually contrary to the very purpose of the Holy Spirit. Stay with me, stay with me. Take a look at the very first time we see the manifestation of tongues. Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes, these disciples who are gathered in the upper room begin to speak in other tongues. But the tongues they speak in in Acts 2 is not the same as the glossolalia that Paul teaches about in 1 Corinthians 14. Go on and read it. Because what happens in Acts 2 is that the Holy Spirit enables these Galileans to speak in known languages that they have not been trained in. So that those who are gathering around are seeing these uneducated Galileans speaking in foreign languages that they understand and they can't figure out how somebody who didn't study French speaks French. How can somebody who doesn't know German speak German? How can someone who's never studied Japanese speak Japanese? Because the Holy Spirit has enabled them to speak the gospel in known languages as fulfillment to Jesus' prophecy that when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will be my witnesses in all the earth. And so I've got to equip you to preach the gospel in languages that people understand. So that the power of the Holy Spirit is to help me speak in a way you understand. So if I speak in public in a foreign language that you don't understand, Paul says you might as well be speaking into the air. How can someone say amen to something they don't understand? And therefore, it is out of order for someone to pray publicly in a tongue that does not have an interpretation because we don't know what they're saying. Now, I know what this means for you, but I'm going to tell you what it means for me. I don't let folk lay hands on me and talk in tongues. Don't touch me. Because I don't know what you're saying. You might be cursing my life. I don't know. You ain't going to talk in tongues. If you want to pray over me, pray in good old-fashioned English. As Paul says, if I don't understand, I can't be edified. He says the second problem is that you all have, have perverted the priority of tongues. You've made it such a big deal that in verse 12 he says, now everyone desires to talk in tongues. You, you've made the public expression so prevalent in your worship that when people come in, they think that's all the Holy Spirit is about. So now everybody wants to talk in tongues. Everybody wants to have their hands laid on them. Everybody wants to be taught how to speak in tongues. And some people, although they're sincere, they may not be gifted to speak in tongues. They may be mimicking what the crowd is doing. Come here, come here. Because one of the greatest influences of behavior is crowd. So Paul says, listen, although every believer can have the access of the intercession in, part in private prayer, the public speaking is not what everybody's gifted to do. The Holy Spirit has not gifted every believer to be able to stand at a microphone in public and speak in tongues and have interpretation. 
everyone is not gifted the same. There is no one universal gift that every Christian believer ought to be able to exhibit, which means you do not have to talk in tongues to prove you have the Holy Spirit. Go back to chapter 12, verse 30. Paul says, listen, everybody doesn't talk in tongues. Everyone doesn't have that gift. Everyone doesn't have to do that. Whenever somebody tells you that you have to talk in tongues, remind them Jesus never did. As a matter of fact, when Jesus wanted folk to understand, you know what he did? He told parables. He said, look, look y'all ain't, ain't hearing me. Let me push it like this. Uh, a man went out to sow some seed. A certain man had two sons that they were acting up a little bit. A woman lost a coin in her house. Jesus made it relevant and real and clear. That's how Jesus spoke. And I would rather make it clear than to try to hide it behind spiritual talk. What's amazing in scripture is that no one anywhere is ever taught how to speak in tongues. Because you can't bring the gift on yourself. It's not something you practice and you get better at. This ain't going to the gym. Some of us can, and some of us can't. Y'all know I, I, I used to coach a little basketball for the eight and nine year olds, and, and when I coached at house league, the, the difference between house league and travel is that anybody can join the house league team, right? Any, anybody. And so you, you get some kids in there that, that are clearly, clearly, <laughs> clearly not basketball players. And, and the reason they don't let me coach anymore it's because <laughs> because I had a team once, and there's a couple kids on there that just could not play, and the parents got mad and called a meeting with the commissioner because I didn't play their kid enough, and I sat in that meeting and told them, listen, I don't mean no harm, but your child ought to play soccer. Your child is not meant to be a basketball player. They can't run. They can't dribble. You might want to try the library because your child is not made for the basketball court because everybody is not gifted the same. This ain't house league. The Holy Spirit does not gift us all to be able to do the same thing. We are gifted in different ways. Can I tell you why you have to have different gifts? Because you're not a church all by yourself. If you had every gift, you would need him, and you would need her, and you would have no need of them. So God says, I'm not going to give you every gift. I'm going to make sure your gift needs his gift, which needs her gift, so that you will bind up as a body. Oh, teach pastor. Uh, I got I to go. I got to go. I'm, I'm tired. Uh, uh, and what's the third problem? So the problem is they didn't understand the difference between public and private. They elevated to the point where they distorted it and made it feel like everyone needed to speak in tongues. Uh -huh. But Michelle, here's the deep one. See if y'all can get me. He says in verse 14 and 15, he says, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. If I speak in tongues, it engages my spirit, but my mind is left out because my mind doesn't even know what I'm saying. So if all y'all are tongue talking, your worship is all spiritual, but it does not engage the intellect. And Paul declares that there is something unbalanced about worship that's all spiritual and no intellect. Huh, the, the problem is there's a lot of tongue talking, but no teaching. There, there's a lot of shouting, but no substance. Uh, there's a lot of hand waving, but no mind engaging. There, there's a lot of praising, but ain't nobody learning nothing. I, I got to leave you right there, but 
But I come back to say there's nothing wrong with spiritual worship. Nothing wrong with waving a hand. Nothing wrong with standing up and giving God glory. Nothing wrong with making a joyful noise unto the Lord. Nothing wrong with doing the Pentecostal two-step. Nothing wrong with taking a lap around church. But there's something wrong when that's all there is. Shame. Shame is the worship service that makes you shout but don't make you think. Shame is the worship service where you can praise but never learn anything new. Shame is the worship service that makes you give God glory but doesn't teach you anything about the Word of God. Shame is the worship service. I, I can't go to church and shout for two hours and not learn anything. I can't be in church and sweat all my clothes out and be as dumb after the benediction as I was before the call to worship. That when worship is real. Can, can, can. It's a shame. Go home from church. Somebody asks you, was church good? You say yes. They say, what he preached about, I don't know, but he sure preached. Shame. I teach young preachers to open up a Bible and in your sermon you don't say nothing I didn't expect you to say because you didn't teach me anything new. I can't leave church with the same questions afterwards that I had before. I can't sit in church where I don't learn nothing. Paul says the problem with tongue talking with everybody is that you've made worship all spiritual but the intelligence is unfruitful. That worship at its best not only touches your heart, it fills your head. So I not, only, I not only praise, but I think. I don't just give thanks, I wrestle. You, 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 you know, it's like um, Dean Wallace, it was a little while back, and I've learned that I'm, 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 I just need you know, I'm really competitive. Um, I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't like losing anything. But my dad taught me I can stay in bed and come in second. I, I get up to win. Um, um, and I got my competitiveness from, from my family upbringing. And I, I'll give you an example. It was, it was Thanksgiving a little while back while my, while my dad was still alive, and, and I noticed uh, that my mom and my sister are a little competitive. They're competitive, it was Thanksgiving, and they're competitive about who can cook the best. So, so my mother had made a sweet potato pie, and my sister brought over lemon meringue. After dinner was over, Wanda, uh, they went into the room where the desserts were, and there was a sweet potato pie. And there was the lemon meringue. And Deuce was a little boy, and he walked in, and he stood looking between the sweet potato and the lemon meringue. And I start praying, Lord, please let him choose the right dessert. Because I noticed that my mom and my sister were standing there watching to see which one he would choose. He's looking at the sweet potato, and he's looking at the lemon meringue, and I'm in fervent prayer. The Holy Spirit is interceding. I am, <laughs> Lord, don't let him choose the wrong pie. To my dis disgust, he chose the lemon meringue, put it on his plate, and I'll never forget what my mom said. She said, that may look good, but it's a lot of fluff. There's no substance to that. I just need some folk who come into worship on Sunday and declare that I'm not here for a lot of fluff. I'm not here just to shout and clap. 
I'm here because I need some substance in my soul to help me make it through the hell I'm going through. Is there anybody here that says, I need some substance? I need some head and some heart. I need some intelligence. I need some understanding, and I'll praise him. I need more than fluff. Paul says you got to have more than that. Listen, listen, the Holy Spirit intercedes privately different than she does publicly. The gift of speaking in tongues is not everybody's gift and it's not the only one. You don't have to speak in tongues to prove you have the Holy Spirit. And a service that is all spiritual is great, but if the understanding is not fruitful, Paul says that's not beneficial. Here's the conclusion of the matter. He says, I will pray in the spirit and in understanding. I will sing in spirit and in understanding. Pray with me. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you've entered my heart the moment I said yes to Jesus. I may have never spoken in tongues. I may have never had land, hands laid on me but I know that you live inside of me. I pray now that you'd put me in that place of prayer where I experience your interceding in my prayer life, where my prayers go deeper than my needs and my wants, that my prayer puts me in a place where all I want to do is connect with God. Remind me, Holy Spirit, that speaking in tongues publicly may not be my gift but there's so many others that you brought to me. And that when I come to worship, it is not simply to engage in spiritual pleasure, but to feed my mind and my heart. Thank you, O Lord, for your spirit and her giftedness. In Jesus' name, amen.